Hey everyone, this is Ryan Corbin with Broadcast Buddy TV, the all-around go-to channel for all things broadcast television. And on this channel, it is our goal to equip you with the tips, tricks, and know-hows to help make you a better broadcaster. So if you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing and hit that bell icon so you never miss an upload. And with that being said, let's get started. So today I wanted to take you all along for the ride on a new build I'm working on, what I would like to call a remote press box for an outdoor broadcast production unit that will be covering primarily live sports. The purpose of this build will be to help us streamline the setup of our announcers in the press box of a venue by consolidating the audio, video, and network signals into one handy breakout box. Now, this won't be the first time I've done something like this, as I've already implemented a similar concept in my other unit to which it has considerably shortened the time and complexity of the overall setup before the actual broadcasting of a game. This is because in these builds, I utilize a single multi-strand tactical fiber optic cable snake between the breakout box and the units. Now, I wanna preface this video with a simple fact. When coming up with a design, there are a whole slew of factors to consider. The ease and time of setup on site, the overall complexity of the design, and of course, the budget. To be honest, I initially started writing the script for this video with the full intention of breaking down my philosophy and thought process going into this project and realized that it was turning into quite the monster of a video. So I decided to cut that out for now and make a future video dedicated to the concept. I might even make it into a podcast format and get some other engineers to weigh in. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments. Is that something you all would like to see? Anyways, let's talk a little bit about the application of this project and then we'll get into the design. When setting up for an outdoor broadcast, using a football game for today's example, the first thing is figuring out where you're going to set up your unit. In a perfect world, you would more often than not want to position it in a location that would yield the most ease for setup. And this would mean parking in a location that would give you the shortest cable runs to your devices, such as your cameras and microphones. However, like anyone who's been doing this for long enough will tell you, this perfect world scenario is about as common as a news anchor showing up on time for a mic check. And because of this, the length of your cables and the route you need to take to get them back to your unit can play a significant part in your setup time, but also your transmission medium for signals. Now, before we dive deeper into what that means, it should be said that the scope of this problem does have a bit of variance to it depending on what level of sport you're covering. For example, most newer NFL stadiums are designed with TV coverage in mind and therefore have kind of thought this through. TV trucks have designated areas they are assigned to within the venue and even sometimes are provided a BSP at their parking location. BSP stands for Broadcast Service Panel and it's essentially a point of contact where cables going in and out of a mobile unit are connected within a venue. These BSPs then distribute the truck signals throughout the venue to various other hookups at advantageous locations. BSPs are also commonly referred to as ECPs, or engineering connector panels, or also tailboards for all of you in the UK and Australia. However, my production units are not covering NFL games. They are covering various college level and high school games. So more often than not, these stadiums are not typically equipped to handle production units. As a matter of fact, you can get quite a variety in quality of venues when dealing with these levels of play. Therefore, it can really be hit or miss when it comes to where your access is for parking the unit. You could be in an ideal position or you could be not so lucky. So when deciding our transition method for our audio, video, and network signals, we need to keep that worst case scenario in mind because if we in fact need to park the unit a ways away, that potential distance will play a huge role in how we decide to get our signals from A to B. This is why I've opted to use fiber for these builds. It's both lightweight and optimal for any length of cable run that I would possibly run into. All right, so now that we have a little bit of context behind the purpose of this project, let's get into the design itself. For that, we'll turn to Lucidchart. All right, so here we are in Lucidchart and you can see the uh, design is set up and ready to go here. And uh, we're gonna break this down for you as best as we can, uh, as simplistically as we can to uh, kind of give you the overall arcing 
concept here. So on the left hand side, you're going to see in this kind of grayed out box is effectively what is going to be inside the fly pack and by extension inside the production unit. And on the right hand side, you're going to see what is going to be in the remote press box itself. So we'll start on the left here. Essentially, and this is going to be a little bit unique to this whole situation is we're kind of designing this entire system around this guy here, which is the graphite. It's a Ross Video product that is their all-in-one production system. And uh, it effectively is a switcher, character generator, clip server, and audio mixer all-in-one. And it handles primarily for its audio side of things, embedded audio. Um, and what I mean by that is HDSDI video, uh, the SMT standard, carries channels of embedded digital audio within that video stream. So in order to get analog audio into this SDI stream, they have these unique little boxes that they call ABUs or ABMs, audio breakout units or breakout modules, tomato, tomato. But they just act as little clever embedder, de-embedders for analog audio into the digital audio world of the embedded HDSDI video streams. So if I zoom in here a little bit, you'll see that there are actually eight analog inputs and six analog outputs as well as a AES input and AES output which is still digital audio. So really a big part of this design is going to be utilizing these audio breakout modules to take these analog audio signals and get them into HDSDI so that we can transport them over the fiber. So what happens is in the graphite itself on the output of the switcher, there are inputs and outputs, uh, three of each actually, that are meant to work exclusively with the ABMs. And effectively, you would run that output of the switcher to the input of the ABM, as well as vice versa, the output of the ABM to the input of the graphite. And internally, the graphite understands that these are the channels to which it is sending and receiving these analog audio signals from the audio breakout unit. And the internal audio engine that is all handling this is known as RAVE, which is also why it's written on the front of the unit. The first ABM, which is going to live in the fly pack itself, directly connected to the graphite, is what is going to send our mixes to our IFB system and also, once the mixes have been entered into the IP system and it is connected to the producer's microphone, which they can then interject or interrupt the mixes that we're sending to them, they can then be sent back into the audio breakout module here as inputs. And the reason we would do that is so that we could internally assign those inputs and send them to the ABM that is going to be living on the far side here remotely in our remote press box. So that's ultimately where those are going. Now, additionally, we can use outputs from the internal ABM to feed a little monitor here that our producer could be sitting in front of that they could hear the return talkback audio from each of the respective talents, being the color commentator and the play-by-play. -play. So uh, there's essentially three things that you need to be sending to and from. You have the talent's overall microphone, you have the talent's talkback, which is a separate circuit using their microphone that is a interrupt circuit in and of themselves. So when they're holding down their talkback button, they are effectively bypassing their microphone output and instead redirecting it to the talkback output, which then we can uh, use that to isolate a communication path back and forth between the producer and the talent without that audio, that crosstalk, going out over our program audio on air. So that is what the purpose of the talkback channel is. And we would, again, send that to isolated speakers within reach of the producer. So that's what's going on there. Now, 
if we come down here a little bit, we're gonna see some additional things going on, and that's going to be our initial leads going to the remote ABM, which is in the remote press box. So like I said, this supports up to three, and right now in this diagram, I'm showing what would happen with the second one. So just like we have a to frame and from frame, from here, we have a to frame and from frame for the second ABM. So we are essentially sending this to our router, which is a Ross Altrix, and which essentially just gives us some flexibility here and there to, if we weren't using the ABM, we could still use these remote inputs and outputs for additional sources. But in the event that we are using the remote ABM, we would have to make sure that this particular output from the switcher is routed to this location and that this particular input coming from our router patches, which these are essentially just eight BNC spigots in and eight BNC spigots out on the fly pack itself. They're just literally patch panels. And once we have this routed from the Altrix to this destination, which essentially is that patch panel, and then we have this input from the patch panel routed from the Altrix for a destination into the graphite, we have this set up to where it needs to be. So out of the patch panel for the router output, we are essentially going to be sending this to a Aja Fido transmit and receive device, which is taking your HDSDI signal out and in, transmit and receive, and converting it to fiber. And then from there, we are hitting the fiber patch panel in the fly pack itself and that's going to be its final destination before it is then sent over our multi-strand fiber optic snake to get to the destination so really that's all we're doing we're taking the hdsdi feeds ultimately if you just want to not think about the router here at this point we're taking it out of the graphite and we're converting it to fiber this is what the ultimate end game is here hdsdi gets into this little device, converts it to single mode fiber. So additionally, we had said that we wanted to send network signals. So here we have our house switch, which actually this isn't the exact network switch we have. The exact network switch we have has an SFP port here with actual single mode fiber inputs and outputs. So that's why you have two lines of fiber coming in here. You have one output single mode fiber for transmission out, and then you have a receive. So you have one fiber pair going to the switch, and that, because it's natively already single mode fiber, no conversion is needed. We're just taking that directly out to the patch and sending and receiving from there. So that covers four of the six fiber strands that we're gonna be sending over our cable. So if we wanna come down to here, one thing that we do need to send out to the remote press box in addition to our audio, video, and network signals is going to be reference. And the reason being is that in order for the ABMs to pass video as well, we have to have a way to synchronize those video signals to our house reference here in the realm of the fly pack. And the reason is because at this point in time, there is no internal audio resampling within the ABMs themselves, which means that if the source is remote, it's coming in and eventually into the graphite, in order for it to be synchronous with everything else, we would have to apply a internal frame sync to this. And because of that lack of audio resampling, it is going to, by default, strip the embedded audio, which is going to defeat the whole purpose of having the ABM unit remote. So what we're gonna have to do is we're going to have to pull our house reference off of one of our devices that is already carrying it and run it into this device here which is essentially converting our composite video signal, which is really all reference is, uh, be it bi-level or tri-level sync, it's just a composite video signal, 
and converting that into fiber, single mode, which is going to then transmit over that line and get it to the remote press box. And then finally, our last strand of fiber is gonna come in and this is going to actually be carrying another video signal. And this M1 SDI RX is another HDSDI to fiber converter, or in this case, on this side, it would be fiber to HDSDI. And this is going to carry our score camera confidence, whereas the one up here coming from the unit, this HDSDI line is actually going to be our talent camera that's going to be pointed on them so we can of course see what they're doing and bring them to air and then this little portion here we'll explain momentarily as well so from here we get transported over our six strands of fiber and we wind up in our remote press box and just to show you essentially what the end goal of this would essentially look like. I can come up here. So our remote press box, this breakout box, is essentially going to have ins and outs up here on this little patch panel, and it's gonna have the remote ABM stacked right in here as a rack unit. And this one here is actually kind of a floating ABM. So we have three all together, but depending on the situation, it might be advantageous for us to have that additional ABM remote, or it might be more advantageous to have it locally back at the fly pack level. So really the way this is designed is supposed to be modular so that we have that flexibility. So that's ultimately what the goal is going to be for this little breakout box is we're going to take all those signals from these four fiber pairs through here and then within here we are going to internally distribute those signals to these either BNC's, XLR's or Cat5 connectors. So let's see what that ultimately will look like. If we come over here, following up our Aja Fido TR transmit receive, we have its companion on the other side, which is going to be the opposite. It's going to be a receive transmit device. So it is effectively going to just receive this fiber strand here and then convert it back to HDSDI, just like this uh, one is going to receive HDSDI remotely, convert it to fiber, and then again back to HDSDI here. So it really goes to show you at the end of the day, really all we're doing is making some standard fiber conversions so that we can house everything on this one fiber line, again, for the ease of transportation and everything like that. But ultimately, that's what we're doing. So again, over here, Internally, it's just straight HDSDI to and from that audio breakout module. And then here, it's literally the same thing. It's just we're converting it to and from fiber in between for that added flexibility. And you can see that's ultimately where it ends up, of course, going to the from frame HDI spigot and the to frame HDI spigot. And then again, you're gonna see a very similar pattern. So we'll follow up with the network side. Coming out of the switch, we mentioned it was going to be out of a SFP port, single mode LC fiber, and that is then going to come over here to this switch. And this is a little bit more truer of a representation of what this might look like. This uh, probably won't be the exact switch that we go with, just gotta do some research. But it is ultimately going to do a transmit and receive pair into a SFP port of this as well. And now all of a sudden we have our local truck network and internet extended to this remote location. Which is good because if somebody is in the press box and needs to plug their laptop in and get internet, or you know, if I need to plug my laptop in and tweak settings, I can do that as well. So from there, we will actually take several ports of this and we will run it from there to the patch panel of the press box itself. And you can see that here as well, we will basically take four 
Cat5 outputs, so we have that flexibility. One of which, which more often than not, will actually be used and dedicated for a score hub. This is a little unit by Sportscast, which allows us to interface to a variety of scoreboard manufacturers out in the field and allow us to take that data and parse it into an XML file that we can very easily then data link to our expression, our character generator, so that we can have very clean looking graphics that are essentially driven from the same scoreboard operator within the venue. So then finally we'll come back over here and we'll see what the end result is of this fiber transmitter and this HDSDI to fiber receiver. So ultimately the reference is going to meet its companion device over here as a receiver. And this receiver is pretty cool because it actually has two composite outputs. So we don't need to worry about daisy chaining by linking multiple devices together if they don't have a loop out for their reference. And we don't need to worry about sticking an additional distribution amplifier in here to essentially split that feed off in general because it's all kind of built into this unit. It's a little bit more on the pricier side for what it is, but you know, well worth it I think for the, again, the kind of all in one factor there. So we will take that reference and distribute it so that we can feed our camera for our booth cam for our talent as well as feed our HDMI to HDSDI converter to which will be taking in our video feed from our scoreboard confidence camera and then both of those will be feeding their HDSDI outputs into the patch as well. So that's where you see here this is going to be coming in and hitting this transmission box, right? The HDSDI to fiber converter, which is being received on the other side. Now, uniquely, what's really unique about this particular model box is it also has a RS-485 input, which also essentially can be sent over the single mode fiber as well. And the reason you would do that is for control. So this Marshall camera actually has RS-485 controls so that you can remotely control its iris, black level, and other such functions. So that's just kind of icing on the cake with this box is bringing that out to here. We can split that so that we can control multiple cameras if they allow for that particular type of control. And ultimately on the other side, where we said we would explain that, that's where this RS-485 is coming off of this box and then ultimately winding up over here to a RS-485 to USB controller into something like a computer or a Microsoft Surface where we can take that signal and then open up like the Marshall's native software and control that camera remotely. So back on the other side, we talked about the video, the sync, the control for these two devices. And then we also have our program feed coming out to a monitor. So the talent in the press box can also see things like replay or the shots that are currently being driven. So that's usually pretty important that they can see that. So here's why I said we would kind of explain this concept a little bit later. So on the ABMs, because we are essentially sending this uh, HDSDI to and from the frame, there are other ports, other HDSDI ports on the RAVE ABM as well that are for HDSDI in and HDSDI out. So effectively, each ABM can pass a video signal in and then essentially be re-embedded with the analog audio signals and then that is what ultimately goes to the frame into that input on the switcher and then vice versa. From the frame, it can carry an HDSDI video signal and then be de-embedded with the analog audio outputs and then sent from the RAVE ABM. So in this case, from the frame, we are sending internally, we're routing program to that switcher output, which then comes to here 
carries the audio embedded and then gets de-embedded here and then loops out, which then winds up here in our monitor for program. And then same with our input of the camera. It essentially comes out of the camera and goes into the ABM and then it is embedded with these analog audio channels and then is sent out of the ABM to frame to that switcher input, which then again, the graphite recognizes that uh, input as being attached to a ABM. And then we can pull those embedded channels on the rave audio mixer as independently controlled faders. And then from there, we have our cough boxes, which this is the device that is effectively in front of the talent color or play by play or whichever. And we are, as I mentioned before, taking their microphone output, we're taking their talk back output, and we are running them into the input channels of the ABM. We are then taking an analog output from the ABM and running it into here for the IFB. And one additional thing is the referee mic. So we have a referee mic receiver because it's essentially wireless, right? We have a wireless mic on the referee who's on the field and that is transmitting to our receiver up in the press box, which gives us advantageous location for receiving that signal. And then we have that running into a input here that we can just carry back as well. So ultimately that's all that's happening here is we are utilizing the ABMs as well as a couple other devices within the press box to receive audio and video signals as well as network and a little bit of serial data and sending it to and from the fly pack and the remote press box. So yeah, now that we have all this kind of sorted out and put together, I unfortunately have a ton of other projects I have to do simultaneously with this. So what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna turn this over to Dan, he is my E2 and he worked with me quite a bit and uh, you probably have actually seen him pop up in some of my other videos as he's helping me put together some things or is, you know, just kind of a friendly stand-in. So take it away, Dan. Hi friends, I'm Dan. I'm a broadcast technician. I work pretty closely with Ryan on a lot of his projects on our production units. So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be building a press box. And so this is our skeleton essentially. This is a soft case that we're going to start with and it is a 4RU case. It actually has a nice Velcro interior so if we wanted to Velcro something to the wall we can do that. And it's about 11 and a half inches deep. So we'll be able to accomplish what we need with this. It's not a lot of space but we actually managed to find quite a bit of equipment that is small and compact enough to fit in there and still accomplish what we need. So the basic layout of this, and Ryan might have talked about this already, the top here is going to be our IO plate. And actually we got a nifty little one right here and it's got 16 uh, inputs, outputs that we can put on here and we can just mount it right up there on the top. And it's actually got room for labels so we can use our label maker and label each one, pretty nifty. In addition to that, these two are used, these two next are used are going to be our audio breakout modules. And Ryan might have mentioned this in an earlier video. These basically interface with our fly pack switcher. It's an all-in-one switcher that includes our audio engine. And then next on the bottom RU is going to be our power supply. That's going to obviously provide power to everything in the box, but also it's going to have a lot of plugs on the front, 120 volt AC so that we can plug in other peripheral devices to the press box. All right, so let's get started.
All right. Looks can be deceiving, but we're not even close. We still gotta do the IO panel. That's gonna take some time. And also we need to do the internal cabling yet and add a few pieces of equipment on the inside of the box that you won't be able to see on the front. So let's dive into this monstrosity. You stole all of my stuff. I had all of that set aside for this. Well, technically my project came first, so you took my stuff. Technically my project needs done first <laughs> while I'm recording this. All right, so this is the finished product on the front. So what we have here on the IO panel, now that it's in, we've got our four fiber connections and those are going to be coming through a fiber snake that's how everything in the box and everything in the truck transmits between the box and the truck and then we also have our um, our LAN connections here we've got our four RJ45 jacks and those are going to plug in for certain peripheral devices that we have that are networked like score uh, scorebot we also have a laptop for statisticians we also have these S or BNC connections here. These are for different SDI connections for peripheral cameras and also for sync. Now these XLRs, believe it or not, are not for audio. And they're actually for carrying RS-485 data for our peripheral cameras. And those are our Marshall cameras. We are able to plug into them and actually control them remotely through RS-485 data. So that's going to be transmitted over fiber back to the truck and we're actually going to be able to control the cameras from that. And now that we have all that explained and the front is all good, we're actually going to dig into the back and put in the new uh, smaller pieces of equipment. I lied. We're not going to go to the back yet. We're actually going to take this I.O. panel back out because that's the easiest way to get our switch in. As a matter of fact, let me show you that. So this is our nifty little switch that we found, actually. This has a fiber SFP on it. So the nifty thing about that is it plugs right into here. And then these little short jumpers for, e for ethernet are actually gonna plug right into here. Easy peasy. And in addition to that, we're gonna flip it upside down. I put some Velcro on the top. So we can just Velcro that bad boy right to the top of the box so that'll be the easiest way to do it so let's dive into it All right, so now this is the back. So as you can see, we have our switch actually Velcroed to the top of the box now. So that's secure up there. And the cool thing about this is since there's technically a lid, but it zips right off on the back, you can now open this whenever it's running and you can look at the switch and make sure it's working. And you can tell whether or not you've got SFP signal and if you have uh, connection through your ethernet ports. So that's a cool level of convenience there. And as you can see, I'm also kind of trying to route my power cable and, and slack along the side here. That way it leaves more space for me to work with the IO and uh, make sure the cables aren't being uh, constrained too much in any way from any of the hardware that's up there. So another thing to point out here in the back, I've got these two leads right here. These are our XLR. We had these uh, 
pre-soldered already from another project so we're just reusing them and these leads will actually tie directly into a converter and uh, you, you'll see that a little later in the video once I get that out. We're going to be building some HD BNC cables that uh, turn into BNC cables at the other end so that way we can actually connect these to the IO panel on the other side of the box. All right, so as you can see, I stopped partway through. I didn't do that fourth one right there, the input for the second ABU. That's because we're probably not gonna be using that very much. Um, if we do, uh, we can always open the back, put an adapter in, and we can use it that way. So the next thing is we're gonna actually put the fiber converters in that's gonna carry the SDI signal from the main unit to the ABUs. So. We're going to put those in here. We're going to Velcro them again to the box. As you can see, I can act, I actually utilized the Velcro quite a bit in these cables to make sure everything was nice and neat. Uh, but we're going to Velcro those adapters into the box and then we're going to build some cables and put them in. Okay, so as far as the ABUs are concerned, we're all done with this, except for the power, which we'll get to in a little bit. My mistake that I actually made a little bit ago was I put this in, these, this LC jumper. Uh, I thought I was being proactive by doing that. But the problem is, is those are two strands that, I'm, that are LC and I'm only gonna be using one as an LC jump to this reference converter right here. We can properly focus that. So this is gonna have an LC connection here where we receive our sink into the box and that's actually going to feed sync to our uh, Marshall cameras. Now the problem is I've got another SDI converter that's gonna carry our RS-485 data that's got an SC connector. So I'm gonna to need to use an SC jumper for that instead. What I'll have to do is I'll actually have to split this fiber. So we're only taking up one of the ports with it and then we're gonna use a 
LC to ST jumper for this converter right here. So let's hop on it. All right, so now that we have our reference box and our one SDI converter in here, uh, we actually have a few more cables and connections that we have to make for these. So we've got two reference coax cables that are gonna be going up to the IO panel. Well, uh, both of those are actually going to feed our Marshall cameras. And then we also have an SDI uh, input for this SDI converter. The cool, the cool thing about this SDI converter is the other thing that we have to connect to it. We're going to be able to connect these XLRs to it to transmit RS-485 data the opposite direction, going back to the main unit. Now, the, inter the interesting thing to me about that is that it's sending it over one line of fiber. So it's getting full duplex of data whether it be, S so it's SDI one direction and then it's RS-45 data the other direction. So leave some comments if you'd like. Uh, what do you think, <laughs> what do you think is making that possible over one strand, whether it be frequency division uh, or possibly time division? Uh, or if, it's, uh, if you have some other theory, let me know. I'm, I'm interested to see what you guys think. So let's get to putting this back together then. All right guys, now for the finishing touches. Uh, we just need to put power on the two ABUs. And what I'm actually going to do to accomplish that, because as you can see, we're actually running out of a bit of space here. So the best thing that we actually found to save some space is we've got these little short 120 volt AC power cables. I'll try to focus that so you guys can see it. So. These cables are very short, they'll save you a lot of space, so if you're ever in a situation where you need to save some space, you can probably find some of those. So we'll get started and we'll just plug these right in and then it'll be all finished. So that is that, all finished. Thanks for watching guys. All right, so here we are at a actual shoot and we're going to be putting the remote press box to the test. Uh, 
not really. It, it has been tested, it works. I would not be crazy enough to set this up and hope that it worked the day of an actual shoot, but yes, it works. But I wanna show you guys in a live scenario uh, what this would look like. Typically, when we go into the press box, we set the remote press box kit up, we test it and everything like that. Um, this is gonna be a four camera shoot with two uh, remote talent locations, one in the end zone and one in the actual press box. So let's move on in and get everything set up and tested. And here we are, the moment we've all been waiting for. We are in the actual press box for a live shoot for the high school stadium. We have the remote press box behind me. So let's go ahead and get it set up. Now that's how you pack a Pelican case. So the other thing I wanted to do to make this you know, easier is from the diagram, I actually printed out this uh, little helpful sheet to show what the ins and outs are gonna be with the ABMs and then uh, actual uh, assignments to what those are. So I'm gonna go ahead and fill those out with these, uh, with these Sharpie markers so that there's no confusion of what needs to be put where now and in the future. So we also have our score camera, which is going to, as I mentioned before, be pointed at the scoreboard for confidence. Um, and also, not only confidence, but if our scoreboard harvesting device um, for some reason has issues, we need to be able to have the real-time clock from the scoreboard to kind of fall back on. Uh, so we can use the switcher to uh, take that clock uh, from the camera off of the scoreboard and put it into the actual graphic itself for the score stripe. So I'm going to find a good uh, place for this to shoot it at the scoreboard and uh, go from there. You can see there are our power strand pairs. So then what we're gonna do is we're gonna be right back. We're gonna plug the fiber in on the other side and then we should start to see some stuff light up here. So stand by. So here we are down on the ground. You can see we're set up here. There's our generator. Here's the production unit. And that's where we are currently staging the remote press box. So in this case, we ended up pretty lucky. We were able to set up directly right behind the press box. And like I mentioned earlier, that isn't always the case, but sometimes you get lucky. So we already fished the fiber cable up to the top and now uh, we're gonna go ahead and plug it in down here into the video fly pack. So here's the other side of the fiber reel and you can see we're fishing it into our little mouse hole here in the side of the trailer and just on the other side is gonna be the fly pack where we're gonna put in our tack fiber. And just like that we're on the other side of the mouse hole where we fish this through and like we said here we have our tack fiber pieces and here's where we're gonna plug them into on this side of the fly pack. And uh, while we're doing that, you can kind of see some of where the uh, 
other devices are that we had shown in the diagram initially, some of the uh, HDSDI to fiber converters, the uh, up there is the other side of the yellow brick for the sink chain and everything like that. So let's go ahead and plug these in and see if we start to get some stuff up top. All right, so as you can see, that is excellent. We have programmed successfully coming from the switcher, uh, from the truck to here. So we are definitely passing video and uh, at that point embedded audio as well. So uh, let's finish our setup. We've got a few more things. I got to do the booth cam yet and uh, then we can uh, get ready for fax checking, uh, making sure everything is working as intended. All right, great. So now that everything is uh, effectively hooked up, I can uh, actually remote desktop into the uh, graphite down in the truck with the uh, team viewer. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go into Ross dashboard and now cycle through my sources on program since we know we're getting program here. So we have bars up right now. So if I switch to booth cam, there it is. And you see, we got we got our booth cam, and then if I switch to score, there we go. There's our scoreboard camera pointed at the scoreboard, all framed up and ready to go. So uh, yeah, now that we got video confirmed, we'll uh, wait for the other portions to be set up, and we'll do a audio fax check to make sure our play-by-play uh, -play microphone, his talkback and his IFB are all working properly as well. All right, now that everything's set up, we'll go ahead and test the audio portion to make sure it works. Check one, check two, check one, check two. Yeah, I you, you hear me, I hear you. Okay. I hear you, yep. can you hear me? Dave, can you hear me? Check, 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 talk back, check. Very good, very good. So everything sounds like it's working as intended. All right, all clear. Thanks. And there we have it. Video works, audio works. Um, Everything works, so we're ready for the game. After the stop by the Bald Eagle defense, Ben, but not right, and then Persico pushes it wide right, so no points for the Red Bengals, and the Bald Eagle area defense gets the hole. So the missed field goal by Dan Persico, he was two for three this year, pulls it to the right, pushes it right, and we're gonna step aside. Still no score, 724 to go. Here in the second quarter on Hot the Front and Night Rivals, presented by Conta Health System. Well guys, that will about wrap it up for today's video. I know it was a long one, but I appreciate you sticking to it if you've made it this far. Uh, make sure to let me know in the comments how you enjoyed it, if you enjoyed it. It was a slightly different format than what we did initially with my first Let's Build video, the Shader in a Box, which if you missed, make sure you check that out. It's a lot of fun. And uh, thank you guys for sticking around. We recently hit 1,000 subscribers, so I appreciate that. I appreciate you, and I appreciate you uh, sticking with me with the channel here as I uh, push on and expand my content. So thank you very much, and with that being said, we'll catch you right here next time on Broadcast Buddy TV.